This program is brought to you by Emory University. All right, good morning, everybody. Happy Friday morning. Welcome to the Friday Fellows Conference. Our speaker this morning, as you can see, is Dr. Mariana Garcia. Uh, Dr. Garcia is a fourth year fellow uh, in our clinical investigator track. Uh, she grew up, if I recall, both in New York City and Mexico. Yeah. So did her medical training, uh, medical school in Mexico, uh, did research fellowship at the Mayo Clinic, then went to the University of Connecticut for her internal medicine residency, uh, did uh, her research years here with Dr. Baccarino, and is going to be doing a year of um, advanced imaging uh, next year. And as you can see, she's going to talk to us today about hyperacinophilic syndrome. So take it away, Dr. Garcia. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for that kind introduction, and good morning, everyone. And yes, the title of my presentation is Hyper Eosinophilic Syndrome, Cardiac Diagnosis and Management. Um, I have no disclosures, and we'll go through sort of a brief outline of what to expect. I'll be going through actually two case descriptions, one at the beginning and one towards the end. Um, we'll then review the pathophysiology and clinical presentation of hyper eosinophilic syndromes with a very brief discussion of its management. And then lastly, we'll, we will explore the role of multimodality imaging in cases of cardiac involvement in hyper eosinophilic syndrome. So I'll start with the first case. Um, this is a 38-year-old Hispanic female, she's Spanish-speaking only, um, who's a transferred from an outside hospital system to Emory's advanced heart failure team for further management of a very clinically sort of complex case. Um, she has a past medical history of heart failure with, presu uh, with preserved ejection fraction, uh, presumed to be from eosinophilic heart disease, a known LV thrombus, iron deficiency, anemia, and hypertension. In terms of her past social history, she is originally from Guerrero, Mexico, and she lives with her children, never smoked. Um, her past obstetric history, she again has four living children, but in 2020 did have an intrauterine fetal demise at 29 weeks gestation. And at presentation to this uh, outside hospital system um, for this encounter, she, she was currently 11 weeks pregnant. So as I mentioned, the patient <clears throat> is uh, an undocumented immigrant. And as we know, they often go without needed medical care. So her full medical history wasn't clear to us when she was was transferred, but through review of her outside records, we were able to gather sort of the following. Um, the first encounter with the specific outside medical system was in June of 2020, um, after presenting at 29 weeks of gestation and found to have intrauterine fetal demise. And there wasn't really much more details into the cause of this. Um, then about a year later, um, she returned with fevers, rigors, a complicated UTI, and uh, was found to have a strep mitis bacteremia. Um, at that point, ID at this outside hospital was consulted, and it was uh, recommended that she undergo a TE to rule out uh, endocarditis. And this is where things start to get interesting. Um, and I and I was able to obtain those that sort of outside uh, TE that was obtained that year. So as we can see, um, the T in September of 2021, um, very obvious large LV apical echo density here um, with moderate to severe eccentric MR. There was really no evidence of valvular vegetations and she had a negative bubble study. Um, this then led them to order a cardiac MRI at the outside hospital. Um, this was a limited study, uh, non-contrast. The patient actually had um, severe claustrophobia, so it was sort of a limited study. But what we were, what they were able to gather here was again that obliteration of the LV uh, apex due to the adherent thrombus. Um, she had this very sort of by atrial enlargement, and there was also evidence of the moderate mitral regurgitation. Um, and with the, with this cardiac MRI, it, it, it was then favored to represent this hyper eosinophilic endocarditis or low flare endocarditis. So um, 
after this encounter, she completed two weeks of IV uh, rosefin. She's initially started on Eliquis, but again, due to her uninsured uh, status, she's unable to afford this and is switched to Coumadin. And she's referred to establish care with both cardiology and hematology oncology for this presumed um, hyperiosinophilic syndrome. Based on outside uh, note records from Hemonk, they, they seem to agree that despite no evidence of elevated eosinophils, this was likely sort of a late stage hyper eosinophilic syndrome and organ damage. She does undergo a bone marrow biopsy, which was negative for eosinophils, and uh, a panel was negative for rearrangements. Um, then in July of 2022, she becomes pregnant again as, after testing uh, positive at a home pregnancy test. Um, she reaches out to her uh, providers and it's recommended that she start Lovinox. Um, but again, she's unable to afford this. Um, she is then transferred to sort of a cardio obstetric clinic at this outside hospital system. And during that initial uh, visit, she does endorse worsening symptoms of dyspnea, shortness of breath, and chest discomfort. So she's instructed to go to the emergency room for admission. So then um, this is now uh, um, August, end of August, she's admitted at, uh, for acute decompensated heart failure. She's given IV uh, diuretics. Um, and then sh just shortly after, four days later, in sort of a multidisciplinary team effort involving maternal fetal medicine, OB, cardiology, obviously the patient uh, uh, with the patient and through shared decision-making, um, she's offered to terminate the pregnancy given that you know, her life was in imminent danger with high risk of mortality if she were to continue with it. Um, she's currently, she was currently 11 weeks pregnant and she undergoes DNC. Um, at that point, um, referral to Emory for heart failure and transplant uh, evaluation is requested and then she is transferred to us. So um, on admission to us at Emory, we obtained our own uh, transthoracic echo at, on arrival. And here we have sort of these two uh, parasternal long views where again, the striking sort of large LV apical thrombus is present. We can see here the um, sort of moderate to severe eccentric MR and in this apical four chamber again, very striking uh, sort of obliteration of uh, LV. Here we use um, definity um, contrast, uh, which is usually used to improve visualization of apical thrombi. But I think here the value of it was that, you know, there was really no striking wall motion abnormality. This is sort of another image with short axis, just showing the degree of mural of thrombus. And then this is sort of the mitral blow pattern of diastolic dysfunction. And we can see the very tall E waves in comparison to A waves and short D cell time consistent with a restrictive pattern. So in summary, this echo showed a normal EF of 50 to 5%, 50 to 55% with a large LV apical thrombus, grade two diastolic dysfunction, severely biatrial enlargement and moderate to severe MR. And um, this echo report did conclude that the findings were consistent with the known history of low FLIRS. Um, as I said, she never actually had documented elevated eosinophil count. Um, her CBC and chemistry here was unremarkable. Her EKG showed no, S no ischemic changes. Her troponin on admission was 46 and her BMP was 960. So in summary, you know that the, the few days that she uh, stayed with us, she was diuresed aggressively with IV diuretics. Um, she was continued on her topral XL um, and started on spironolactone just prior to discharge, as well as transition to PO diuretics. Um, it was su suggested that she continue sort of therapeutic uh, Lovenox for anticoagulation, and um, she she was told to follow up with us in the uh, Avalon clinic within two weeks. And you know, it it was documented in her chart that she was deemed not eligible for transplant consideration given her uninsured status. <laughs> 
Um, you know, unfortunately the patient lost a follow-up. She did not follow up with us at the Avalon clinic um, within that time period, but I was able to, to sort of to reach out to her and her sister, verify that she was you know, doing relatively well and they had plans to just continue care with the outside system that she had where she had initially been referred to us from. So now I'll move on with my presentation. So <clears throat> by way of introduction to eosinophilic disorders, I'd like to discuss some background on eosinophils as shown on this slide. Um, I think of historical interest, the eosinophil uh, was histopathologically characterized in 1879 by Dr. Paul Ehrlich, who um, sort of mastered the use of aniline dyes to distinguish cell types. And the term eosinophil was born from the observation that the acidic dye eosin reacted strongly with the abundance of highly basic proteins found within the granules of these cells. Um, as we know, eosinophils serve as central function and host defense against helminthic and parasitic infections, and they undergo recruitment and activation in allergic and inflammatory responses. However, you, as part of the immune system's effort to maintain normal functioning or hemostasis, the potential for collateral damage by eosinophils exists. So the normal um, peripheral blood eosinophil count reflects a balance between not only production, but also tissue migration and death by apoptosis. An increase in blood eosinophils is mediated by cytokines or growth factors, which are derived from CD4 positive T lymphocytes or T cells in response to these many conditions. Um, <clears throat> so um, the, there are so-called type one helper T cells that produce interleukin two or interferon gamma, whereas T helper T, uh, to helper T cells produce growth factors or cytokines such as interleukin-4 and interleukin-5. And interleukin-5 in particular is the most important factor involved in eosinophil differentiation growth and survival. And both subsets produce the eosinophil cytokines interleukin-3 and uh, granulocyte macrophage uh, colony stimulating factor. Now, eosinophilic infiltration um, and elaboration of toxic protein substances, including major basic protein and cationic protein is what can ultimately lead to this organ damage. In terms of uh, pathogenesis of eosinophils, they can cause disease through direct cytotoxic effects through the degranulation of these molecules that we just talked about. And they can also recruit or activate inflammatory cells through release of pro-inflammatory mediators. In then pathogenic states, activated eosinophils really play a role in tissue fibrosis, thrombosis, vasculitis, and allergic inflammation. So they can, qu they can cause quite a bit of damage. Now, in terms of the, of the eosinophil count, we know that the upper limit of normal for the range of percent eosinophils in peripheral blood is approximately three to 5% with the corresponding absolute count of about 350 to 500 cubic uh, uh, millimeters of blood. Now, the severity of eosinophilia has been arbitrarily divided into mild, that is an absolute count uh, ranging from 500 to uh, 1500. Um, and this is what's gen generally termed as eosinophilia, to moderate, uh, where the absolute count ranges from 1,500 to uh, 5,000 and severe beyond 5,000. And this is what generally represents hyper eosinophilia. It's important to note, note, though, that the number of eosinophils cannot always predict organ involvement. However, levels greater than 1,500 are most associated with organ damage, regardless of the cause, and this always warrants further evaluation. Now, the way that we classify tissue eosinophilia is by presence of greater than 20% of the nucleated cells in the bone marrow by way of a bone marrow biopsy, or by a markedly increased tissue infiltration of eosinophils, which is always done by an experienced pathologist. And sometimes we don't actually see the eosinophils there, but we'll see remnants of, the, of them. 
um, meaning that they were there. So whenever you're really concerned that there could be uh, eosinophil pathology in a particular organ system and you don't see the eosinophil, um, there's just a tip that you may ask the pathologist to do some staining for eosinophil derived granule proteins, because sometimes the granule proteins are there after the eosinophils degranulate and, um, and eosinophils are not noticeable anymore. So the point I wanna make with this uh, next slide is that eosinophilia, as we just defined, has many, many causes or many things associated with, with, the, with it. Of course, infectious diseases. So typically we think, uh, helminths and fungi um, and those, those sorts of things. But interestingly, that viruses such as HIV can also be associated with eosinophilia. And of course, we know um, allergic diseases, um, many drugs, um, neoplastic disorders, and of course, uh, all sorts of immunologic disorders are known to be potentially associated with eosinophilia. Now, I wanna make a pause here because um, I found it particularly interesting that in, early, in order to fully grasp our current understanding of what's termed hyper eosinophilic syndrome, we, uh, we really need to take a dive into sort of the historical context of things. Um, so um, we'll go back all the way to 1936 to uh, Dr. Willem Loeffler, who was a Swiss doctor, um, and he was actually the first one to describe eosinophilic cardiac disease um, or Loeffler's endocarditis after a report of two patients um, with what he described fibroplastic parietal endocarditis with blood eosinophilia, um, which is consistent with the endomyocardial fibrosis seen in hyper eosinophilic syndrome at the later stages. Then in 1955, this case report by Hoffman may have been the first US case report of what we now regard as a, a hyper eosinophilic syndrome. Um, treatment at the time was supportive. There was no effort to reduce eosinophils and it's likely that this was a case of eosinophilic uh, leukemia. Then in 1968, the concept of hyper eosinophilic syndrome was introduced by this uh, by Dr. Hardy and Dr. Anderson. Um, they observed three male patients with marked peripheral blood eosinophilia who developed severe cardiac disease. And then by 1975, hyper eosinophilic syndrome was defined uh, with three proposed diagnostic criteria by uh, uh, the Chusid and his uh, group. Um, this, the three diagnostic criteria consisted, consisted of persistent eosinophilia for longer than six months, lack of evidence for parasitic, allergic, or other known causes of eosinophilia, and then presumptive signs and symptoms of, our, of organ involvement. So this could be hepatosplenomegaly, murmur, um, pulmonary fibrosis, fever, anemia, um, and even weight loss. Nowadays, given the various identified molecular mechanisms underpinning hyper eosinophilia and the subsequent sort of heter heterogeneity of diseases that encompass the spectrum of hyper eosinophilic syndrome, this first set of diagnostic criteria has become outdated. So we'll fast um, forward to the year 2011. Uh, where the Working Conference of Eosinophil Disorders and Syndromes took place. It, it took place in Vienna, and they were tasked with reviewing the criteria for establishing the, di the definition. And the goal really was to sort of to simplify the prior classifications into a more contemporary scheme. So <clears throat> first, blood um, hyper eosinophilia um, has to be present has to be present at least over 1,500 uh, on two examinations four weeks apart. Um, in case of life-threatening organ damage, sort of fulminant myocarditis or respiratory failure, a preliminary diagnosis can be established without a second examination in order to provide immediate care. Second, there must be evidence of organ damage um, 
or dysfunction attributable to tissue hypereosinophilia. So those three things we talked about, sort of eosinophils in bone marrow, um, a pathologist opinion saying that there's extensive tissue infiltration or sort of those um, marked deposits of eosinophil granule proteins present. And then um, organ damage is defined at least by one of the following being either fibrosis, thrombosis, cutaneous, or, or mucosal erythema, or sort of central neuropathy with recurrent neurological defect. And then third, um, other disorders or conditions must, must be excluded as a major reason for the observed organ damage, meaning the organ damage must be eosinophil driven. Now, um, hyper eosinophilic syndrome can be further subclassified. Uh, I don't plan to discuss this in depth, but it's important to highlight this because this sort of subset of classification is important for our hematology oncology colleagues to guide specific treatment. Um, so here we see these sort of subsets where there's myeloproliferative, lymph, uh, lymphocytic, there's even familial, but we know that in up to 70 some, sometimes 75% of cases of hyper eosinophilia, an underlying cause is not found. So it's sort of this idiopathic subset. And again, these subsets guide treatment. So as we can see, myeloid variants, um, the first line therapy are thyrosine kinase inhibitors, such as imatinib. Um, whereas in others, um, our, our first line therapy is uh, systemic uh, glucocorticoids. Now the course of HES can have various patterns. Um, so as we see here, sort of a pattern A with a single flare without subsequent relapse is possible, which is you know theoretically what could have happened with our first case. A pattern B is sort of these several uh, relapses with intervals of complete remission. And then there's a pattern C here where we, there's sort of a chronic persistent disease. Now, in terms of the epidemiology of hyper eosinophilic syndrome, like this is extremely rare. The overall incidence and, and prevalence has not been well characterized, but um, there was this surveillance epidemiology and end results program for for cancer funded by the National Cancer Institute in 2001. And then over the five-year period, um, they found that um, accrued incidence of just 0.035 per 100,000. Um, the median age at diagnosis was 52 with a male to female ratio of 1.47. Um, certain variants appear to occur exclusively in males, whereas others sort of have an equal distribution between the sexes. Now, in terms of sort of the clinical presentation, you know, it, as we see, it's a multi-system condition. Patients may present with signs and symptoms related to really any organ system. Um, in general, there's always uh, sort of this uh, initial uh, episode of weakness, fatigue, there may be cough, myalgias, um, there may be evidence of shortness of breath and rash and diarrhea as presenting complaints. And as I said, significant heterogeneity. Um, historically, cardiac involvement was felt to be present um, in up to 40 to 50% of hyper eosinophilic uh, syndromes, and it's, a, and it's a major cause of morbidity and mortality. Now, in terms of the stages of cardiac pathology, um, we have this first uh, stage one, which is uh, the earliest acute phase. It comprises this eosinophilic infiltration of the subendocardium and is generally asymptomatic, although fulminant myocarditis may rarely occur with extensive necrosis and progressive heart failure. Um, this uh, usually, um, this duration in the, of the first stage is usually around five to six weeks. In the second stage, intracavitary, mostly ventricular thrombi form, and patients are at a very high risk of systemic emboli uh, embolization. And then over time, um, persistent eosinophilic inflammation leads to development of subendocardial fibrosis, especially in the sort of trabecular region and inflow tracts defining the third stage. 
Um, fibrosis may be diffuse and result in restrictive cardiomyopathy with congestive heart failure. And um, at times endocardial inflammation and fibrosis can involve the valves or, or supporting structures. Now, this is a recent sort of suggested approach to investigation of cardiac involvement in patients presenting, presenting with persistent hyper eosinophilia. Um, so this figure shows a proposed algorithm uh, for the initial cardiac evaluation, whether symptoms are present or not. Um, and regardless of evidence for involvement of other organ systems. So um, what it proposes is that if there are no signs of cardiac disease, you, you can consider doing a cardiac MR for early disease detection. Now, if the cardiac MR is negative, um, you can then follow up with sort of serial troponin, ZKG, and maybe a yearly echo. Um, but if this cardiac MR does show early disease detection and suspected myocardial disease with sort of this typical subendocardial late gadolinium enhancement, then you can, um, you know, start thinking of your uh, uh, hyper eosinophilic syndrome, sort of systemic disease management with help of uh, our hematology oncology colleagues. And then, um, it says here that plus minus sort of endomyocardial biopsy can be uh, can be noted, but they do say that the decision is always made on a case by case basis, integrating the likelihood that it will you know sort of contribute on one hand, and sort of also take in consideration the risk incurred. Um, now, if there are any signs of cardiac disease, then it's, this algorithm goes by the type of cardiac damage. In cases of thrombotic, yeah. Um, evidence of damage, you can consider contrast echo T or cardiac MR and begin anticoagulation. If there's evidence of valvular disease, um, then consider a transesophageal echo, um, you know, and sort of um, considerations for surgical repair. Um, if there's a restrictive physiology, it says to consider strain, again, cardiac MR, rhythm monitoring, and uh, plus minus uh, biopsy and then sort of systolic dysfunction, again, saying uh, to consider strain and cardiac MR and go ahead with your heart failure management. Now, <clears throat> um, endomyocardial biopsy is the gold standard for diagnosis of eosinophilic cardiomyopathy. It's, you know, it's showing presence of eosinophils, or as we said, they're granule products in cardiac tissue. Um, but it does have an, it does have an, uh, have an estimated sensitivity of only 50% and can miss the diagnosis if the area biopsied is not involved. Um, and now moving forward with my objectives, um, I'm, I'm not going to go ahead and sort of talk about the role of multimodality, multimodality imaging. Um, echocardiography is really the key exam to detect hyper eosinophilic related cardiac complications. Um, in its early inflammatory sort of necrotic stage, there can be some increased uh, subendocardial echogenicity with maybe some pericardial effusion. As the stages develop, you can find, of course, the intracardiac thrombi, uh, which can be seen prior to development of fibrosis. And of course, the most distinctive feature is that obliteration of the apex, which can be the, in the left, right, or, or both uh, ventricles. Both ventricles, as I said, may be, may be affected um, and they can lead to high filling pressures and impaired diastolic function. And then in later stages, this thrombi can organize as intraventricular or valvular vegetations. Of course, we can use a contrast for improved visualization of apical thrombi um, and differential diagnosis of ventricular masses. But I hear, I think what's key here is that, you know, usually when one sees ventricular mural thrombins, there's almost always a severe wall motion abnormality associated with this. And this is the exception and um, I think is of diagnostic value. Now, in terms of cardiac MRI, um, you know, it, this has become the, sort of the most sensitive non-invasive tool, allowing detailed tissue characterization at all stages of disease. 
Um, you know, you can do the diagnosis of myocarditis based on like Lewy criteria and then new cardiac sequences like T1 mapping and extracellular volume quantification have emerged as promising tools to better define fibrosis and, and, and edema, allowing for this like spectral based differential diagnosis. So with that, I have a very cool cardiac MRI case. So I'll move with that second case I'll talk to you about. It's very short, briefly. This is a 77 year old male, has a past medical history of non-small cell lung cancer diagnosed in 2016 status post resection. He had long established care with an outside cardiologist for sick sinus syndrome. Um, and in the end, towards the end of 2019, he actually developed a stroke. As part of his stroke workup, um, an echo was obtained. Um, um, of note, he, he, he was found to have positive anti-cardiolipin antibody and was started on Eliquis. Um, I, I don't have the TTE because it was at a sort of private cardiologist group, but there was mention or concern for LV thrombus, so a cardiac MRI was recommended. And this patient did have elevated peripheral eosinophil. So as we see here, towards the end of 2019, when he had that stroke, we see several measurements here of absolute eosinophil counts in that close to hyper eosinophilia range. And so these are his uh, cardiac MRI uh, images. These were with contrast and there was velocity flow mapping, T1 and T2 mapping was also performed for sort of tissue character characterization. And there was also delayed enhanced imaging for delineation of myocardial scar and fibrosis. And what we can see here is, you know, there's evidence of, of thickening within the left ventricular apex, uh, the suggestion of a mass. Um, and then, <clears throat> forward here, we again see sort of this um, mass uh, um, images that sort of assess for thrombus suggested that the apical mass was consistent with thrombus. And then here we have sort of um, this T1 mapping method on the right show that shows this increase T1 signal consistent with fibrosis. And on, on the left, we have sort of this late enhancement series. Um, the late gadolinium enhancement imaging study sort of demonstrates a characteristic three-layered appearance in the ventricular apex composed of, you know, the myocardium or outermost layer, then sort of this diffuse subendocardial delayed enhancement, which is so subtle, and then this overlying hypo-intense area consistent with uh, uh, thrombus. And this has been termed sort of the triple V sign. And so, so far this patient, you know, because of his history of non small cell had long established uh, relationship with hematology oncology, they also felt like um, this was conclusive um, and was diagnosed with hyper eosinophilic syndrome. Um, in terms of the subtype, it's currently undergoing more workup. He did have a bone marrow biopsy that showed elevated eosinophils and uh, he was started on a DOAC. So in conclusion, you know, this is a very rare condition that may have several etiologies. Cardiac involvement is frequent and carries with it a high rate of morbidity and mortality. Um, we've shown that echo is an integral part of the diagnosis, but cardiac MRI has a very important role as well. And, you know, I present sort of two cases here that we had uh, at Emory. The first one was more of a proposed tentative diagnosis of idiopathic HES, even though the classic criteria were not met. Um, and then the case two um, sort of presented with the classic criteria. And so with that, I conclude, I'd like to thank, of course, Dr. Clements for um, all of his support, Dr. Smith sharing um, um, cardiac MRI, and of course, Dr. Chantney, who uh, was actually part of the outside
uh, medical system and helped me um, get a lot of the information for the first complex case. So, and that's it. If anyone has any questions or comments, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Mariana. That was good. Dr. Chamney, former fellow. She was a fellow here at Emory when I was a resident. Um, good to hear from her. Um, the first case, forgive me, I, my phone likes to start going off right as people start this meeting at, on Friday mornings, but so I might have missed that first case. She, she was initially diagnosed with this like a year before, and then sort of was this a flare that she had during this preg this subsequent pregnancy, or do we think it was sort of there all along? Yeah, yeah, no. Persisted. We of course like she 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 doesn't she didn't have sort of established care. Um, so oh, yeah, this was our patient. So yeah. Yeah. Hey, Mary. Exactly. Hey. Yeah, no, we don't think it was more of a flare. We think it was there. It was probably missed, you know, for a long time. And and it was sort of in the setting of bacteremia workup that we did a TE and sort of found it. Um, and then um, that's when she starts getting sort of uh, connected with outside specialists. And uh, in between, she, you know, gets pregnant again. That's I was, yeah, so it wasn't like pregnancy induced pregnancy. No, was probably no. pre pre existing prior. Pre existing, yeah, for sure. Mariana, <laughs> go ahead, Doctor Clements. So uh, that patient of ours, I, I've been thinking about that. Number one, uh, you will. Uh, there's hardly anything else that causes that kind of thrombus. Then when you look at the wall, that particular cross sectional cross-sectional view of the uh, of the first patient was really a remarkable image in that there was what appeared to be thrombus, yet the walls were moving. So all that depends on how much the eosinophils attack the, attack the endocardium and also the myocardium. You know, it can attack the whole myocardium, you wind up with a myocarditis. That may be initially, but then later on you get all this, this kind of organized stuff. Like if you were to biopsy that on the first patient, you'd wonder how much fibrosis is there and how much thrombus is there. And I suppose uh, at that stage of the game, if you give anticoagulants, you're trying to keep thrombus from forming on, forming on top of that. So uh, right. um, the stages, and I have a feeling that that first patient has a rather advanced disease. And if you were to go in there, this would be like a fibrosis that you had to peel off the wall. So uh, notice all the diastolic dysfunction that was associated with it. So anyway, that's that was my thinking about that. Interesting yeah. lady. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Thank you. That was great. That was great. Thank you, Dr. Clown. See you later. Bye. Any questions from the group? Yes, uh, <clears throat> Mariana, great, uh, great talk. And uh, very beautiful uh, presentation of the historical the historical timeline. I like that a lot. And uh, my question to you may be a little unfair question <laughs> because of the very rarity of this disease. Now, in the light of us using a lot of direct anticoagulants and DOACs and stuff, you know, what was your uh, a couple of things? Number one, what was your uh, result of literature? review on the use of DOACs in these situations as maintenance. And the other thing is what do what do the hemonc people think uh, will be enough to uh, anticoagulate these patients and uh, prevent from embolic uh, embolic phenomena? Yeah, I mean, great question. And I, 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 I mean, just talking with so many people, you know, their experience with this sort of disease has been like N of one, N of two, and, you know, some cardiologists had never, I've never even heard of this, but um, I, I think in terms of review of the literature, there was up, I found absolutely nothing in terms of DOAC use, although it is in practice, you know, from what I saw used. Um, and it, specifically in the second case, I saw that hematology oncology was actually comfortable with sort of a low dose DOAC. So they actually had the patient on 2.5 um, and felt that that, that was sufficient. Um, I have no idea where they based it on, but I think, you know, it's a huge area of, you know, sort of unclear 
Uh-huh. Yeah, because in your presentation, you gave us two uh, two patients and you have a 50-50. One was anticoagulated with warfarin and Correct. the other one was anticoagulated with DOAC. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so it's a little bit of a hard one. Uh, I think also mechanistically, I think, um, you know, it makes sense. Do- DOACs make sense, but uh, uh, I don't know. Again, uh, I'm the last one to pretend to be a hematologist here. Correct. So, uh, yeah, but very beautiful presentation. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali. I guess oh, I would ask question. Question. Oh, one ahead. more question. One more question. The first patient, Mariana, you guys, I know he was on the heart care service, but what was the rationale behind uh, the use of metoprolol in him, just for clarification? Yeah, she was on, on her, sorry, I'm not on her, sorry. Sure. Yeah, and that's a great question. I'm not sure. She was already on it um, when she came in. At one point in the outside surface echoes, her EF was noted to be 40%. So it may have been then that it was started um, and sort of just continued thereafter. Um, But it's not something that we started. I think it was, uh, you know, started started that uh, outside hospital medical system in the setting of what was thought to be a lower EF. Mariana, so you'd mentioned transplant in these folks, which a lot of times if they get advanced disease is probably really your only course of action. Um, and if any, you know, I don't know, maybe you saw something about this or if any of our heart failure colleagues have any experience. Again, I'm sure this is a rare occurrence, but, you know, is there, I, I suppose uh, these folks probably possibly do okay with transplant because they're on immunosuppressants to maybe hopefully keep the, hypersynophilia from attacking their, um, you know, transplanted heart. Um, But any experience or any literature that you saw, Mariana, on how these folks do after transplant? I mean, very few. I did find a few case reports of transplant in sort of these subsets uh, where they were treated with sort of tyrosine kinase inhibitors like imatinib. Um, I wouldn't know how it would work uh, with sort of the idiopathic uh, HES scenario, which is actually the most common. Um, and yeah, I didn't find any sort of literature review on, on that subset or know if they would be transplant candidates. I don't know if any of the heart failure attendings here have. Heard. I think, uh, hey, it's Roger Lasker. I think we've done two uh, HES patients, um, predominantly predominantly cardiac involvement. Um, and, and the first year in particular, we did aggressive um, immunosuppression and some monitoring afterwards and, and was on imitap, imitap, yes, that medicine long-term. But I don't think we've done many. I think we've just done two in the last uh, 10, 15 years. All right, well, fantastic. Again, thank you, Mariana, for that review. Uh, and thank you everyone for tuning in. And we will see you. I believe we have a journal club, uh, another journal club next week. Um, But looking forward to seeing everybody next Friday. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.